Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, but Mike, as you were saying, we've known each other for a while now. It's funny how relationship starts to build, and it's good to see people who, um, from other places as well who I've run into. Um, I was working on this talk last week, and I more or less finished it before um, Friday. And um, after the, the, the shooting in New Zealand, um, a talk on technology and religion suddenly took a different kind of focus for me. And I wondered, you know, I obviously couldn't change what it is that I was going to say. But I felt kind of, um, I felt like I needed to say something at, at the start because it, it's, it's such a, um, uh, an, an important uh, sort of current thing that, that's happening. And I'm going to talk sort of generally and positively about um, media and, and social media and religion. Um, and uh, I feel like in, in some way the, the world changes the way that we look at things based on the moment to moment uh, 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 you know, uh, experiences of, of, of the world. Um, I think that we, in, in, at least in the, the political discourse about extremism, the fact that we haven't talked very much about the right wing and we haven't talked very much about um, uh, politically talked about the problem of right wing extremism online um, is troubling to me. And as I look at what I'm talking, going to talk about today, that's also on my mind and thinking about where um, blind spots might be in, in research, um, <coughs> particularly in my own research. Um, and um, so I guess I wanted to acknowledge that at the beginning um, of, of this talk and to say, um, well, I don't know what to say, basically. I spent the weekend <laughs> trying to figure out what it is that I wanted to say, and I, I never figured it out. So um, I think just, just starting at that moment and saying that we, we need to be aware of um, blind spots in research, and I say we, I need to be aware of blind spots in research. I think when I talk to my students, my Muslim students, um, about discrimination and violence, it's something that um, I have a blind spot for. Um, and I want to acknowledge that at the beginning and say that that's an important thing for, um, for me as a researcher to take on board going forward. And as I talk about how technology influences what we believe, that um, I think going forward we need to be, well, we're going to have to be more aware of, uh, of, of blind spots uh, in, in what it is that we're, we're looking at and talking about. Um, sort of a, a, a difficult place to start, but I wanted to start in that place. Uh, uh, particularly today, um, before we go forward. Um, but I want to thank you for having me. I'm not a sociologist. Um, I'm uh, a linguist um, in theory, I guess. Uh, I do a lot of discourse analysis. Um, I, I look at how language is used um, to talk about religion in, um, in different contexts and um, have been interested sort of in, in the, s the scope of my research on, um, on social media as it's developed, I started doing research on social, social media in 2008, you know, when YouTube was just starting out, um, and things have changed significantly. Um, and these questions, I think, are, are sort of the, the, the questions that I started off, off with as a researcher in social media and uh, interaction between people of different religions um, in um, uh, 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 online and, and on social media, and I think that they've, they're actually quite um, robust as questions that, that remain interesting to me. This is from 2004 from Susan Herring, um, talking about, uh, it's funny to look at this as two, 2004 and think about current trends in computer-mediated communication. We don't actually use that terminology so much anymore, the idea about computer-mediated communication, because so much of the interaction that we have is on these, you know, on our devices. It's happening in real time. We were talking about uh, a Twitter. Uh, you're not sitting down now at a computer away from the world and tweeting. You're, you can do it while you're, while you're interacting with people. Um, so the, the world of technology has changed pretty significantly. And I think, but I think these, these questions really um, remain important for us in thinking about the research that we're doing. First of all, the extent to which as we, as we think about technology, whether or not technology is doing anything new necessarily. I think we're, we, we, can, we can sometimes jump on if you're doing new media research or you're doing research on technology to think that whatever the newest thing is is, is, is changing the way the world works. But 
if you've been around enough and seen enough cycles of, of, of technology, you realize that oftentimes uh, things come and things go, and they do have impacts on how people interact with each other, but um, they aren't always genuinely doing something new. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, in, in, um, in the background as I, as I go forward here. And then I guess the other question is about interaction and behavior and how technologies change interaction and, and behavior. Are we really behaving in new ways on Twitter or on Facebook, or are we behaving in the way that we sort of always have behaved, just in in a in a um, uh, in a in a context that is uh, that's different? Um, so I don't want to be too one way or the other about it. I, I try to keep a middle ground about my ideas about technology and, and the extent to which it's uh, you know it's revolutionary in any way. If we think about the history of technology. Um, we need to think about, well, we need to think about uh, history whenever we do any kind of analysis of interaction in, in a media space. And I think as we, uh, as we choose spaces to do analysis um, uh, online, we have to think about not just uh, the, the, the technology that's come before the technology that we're looking at, but also the history of particular platforms. You know, Facebook and YouTube now have been around for quite some time and they have histories of uses. Um, I was just reading with my students yesterday a, 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 an article about Facebook from 2010. And in 2010, Facebook was still around, but I, I don't know if, if, if anyone remembers this now, but when you first got on Facebook and you had those, uh, your status updates, it had your name is, right? So Stephen is, and then you would fill out the rest of that sentence. And so my students who are you know, 18, 19 years old are looking at this, this analysis from Facebook, and they're like, what is this, you know? Um, they, they can understand, of course, that it's, it's changed, but it's just such a different, as we were reading about Facebook from 2010, there were similarities, but it had, it had changed quite significantly. What I think is interesting, though, is that our memory of, of, of Facebook, or our memory of how we use social media sites affects how we use it going forward. So it's not that Facebook gets a bunch of new features, it's that Facebook has been accumulating features over time and our understanding of it from, uh, uh, from as we use it now is, is motivated by how we've used it in the past. And it was funny because as the, the students were talking about the history of it, they were talking about um, you know, how Facebook had developed at Harvard and I remembered um, having gone to university before the time of the internet or just at the beginning of, of when the internet had, um, had, uh, had started to develop, we actually had a face book. It was called Faces, and it was a, a, a book that you got that you looked through, and it had pictures, people's ID pictures, and their names on it, which was, was, was given out on campus. The whole idea was you could see somebody and try to match names and, 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 and faces. Ideally, I think, I think the whole point about this was that you could, you could see people that you were interested in and contact them, figure out who they actually were. Um, but you see that development then of, 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 of things that are offline into online spaces and then the online space developing now to, well, if I, if I show you that, that Facebook that I had from university and we show you, you know, the online platform of Facebook now, they're, they're very different, but we can trace that, that development over time. I think that's important for us in doing analysis to understand why people use sites in the way that they do. Um, <clears throat> that other point about this is that as we're talking, we're, we're, we're communicating in particular ways in online spaces. We aren't just doing our Facebook thing and our Twitter thing and our Instagram thing. We, we might think about them in different ways, but um, the idea about using hashtags on Twitter, for example, then starts to go into other uh, platforms as well. You see face, Facebook using hashtags, you see Facebooks on, or uh, hashtags on, on Instagram as well. There's a kind of relationship of mediated communication um, that is networked in some way, that, that things are drawing on, on each other. And now you think about Facebook um, and Instagram having stories, right? You can, you can post things for a short amount of time. There, there's a kind of cross, uh, cross development of different things. And they're also now owned by the same places as well. Um, as a linguist, as a person who's interested in, in, in analyzing discourse, you can think about this then in terms of discourse practices and you see these connections between different things that are happening online. Um, and uh, those, those discourse practices are important to think about in relationship to each other. Now, this is a talk about technology and belief. Um, 
and I, I, the, the title of it was, was how uh, technology influences what we believe, but I, I think it's probably also how we believe and why we believe as well. Um, because technology doesn't just make it possible for people to give different uh, information in different ways or to, to spread information in different ways, but that spreading of information in different ways results in uh, changes in how people believe. And, uh, and, and what and why they believe. Um, I put up the picture of the printing press. Um, if, if we're thinking about technology revolutionizing the way that we, we, think about, um, uh, we think about faith, we think about religious practices and belief in the real world, well, the printing press is, is, is a, a, a pretty big um, uh, technological advancement that changed things pretty significantly. I mean, you could make an argument that you, you, if you don't have the printing press, you don't have the Protestant church. Um, there, there is there's a one-to-one -one relationship between technological developments. I shouldn't say a one-to-one -one relationship. There is a relationship between technological development and how people see their belief and their practice in, in the real world. So when we talk about technological affordances, and what I mean by affordance, if you're familiar with this word affordance, where we talk about um, uh, sort of what we're able to do within a particular technology, the, the action possibilities within a, in a particular um, uh, technological setting. Um, what the printing press allows you to do, um, it, it allows you to do new things, but it also restricts some other things. So for example, if you think about the affordances of, of print, is that you can um, distribute information across distances, you can produce it relatively cheaply, but I mean, sort of obviously, you can't have any sound in a print book. So you have some things that have opened up, some possibilities that have opened up, but you've also narrowed things down, right? So you, you have some things that you can do, some things that you can't do. And it's worth thinking about that as well. Whenever we have something new that we can do, it also requires, or it also requires us thinking about the things that it, we aren't doing in those, in those contexts as well. So Twitter, um, uh, originally 140 characters, now uh, 280 characters, right? That's an, a kind of affordance. It allows you to communicate um, with a, a, a limited amount of information, and that changes how you communicate in that particular place. There are good things about it, and there are bad things about it. Um, there are good things about books, and there are bad things about books. Um, we, we, sh we shouldn't take a, 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 a positive or a negative position, I think, about on technology um, one way or the other. It's better to think about it in terms of what it allows you to do and what it, uh, what it limits is you to, to, to from doing. Um, as I think about uh, context in social media and, and religious belief in social media, um, I wanted to introduce this idea uh, as well as a kind of a starting point, the idea of context collapse, um, which is that if you have a Facebook page, um, you find yourself interacting with people from a variety of different contexts, right? Um, on my Facebook page, I have, um, I'm friends with uh, colleagues, people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. I am friends with family members, cousins who I, um, you know, uh, who I grew up with, um, and uh, friends, like genuine friends, people that I don't have, uh, 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 I don't have work or familial relationships with. Now, all those people know me in a different way, right? Um, I'd like to think that I'm not, you know, I'm not this, this living this lie most of my time. But we all sort of live lives, don't we? I mean, I'm standing up and talking to you now as, a, as, a, as an academic, but you know, earlier this morning I was um, having breakfast with my wife and I was a husband, and this morning I was with my kids and I was a father. I was a totally different person in those different, in those different places. Now, what Facebook and social media sort of does in general is puts you in a place where you have to present yourself to these different audiences at the same time. And that can be uh, difficult. Um, is it, well, I guess we could think about it in terms of affordances as well. There are good things about it and there are bad things about it. There are things that it allows you to do and there are things that it limits you in doing. Um, the important thing about social media, I think, is this idea about authenticity, which is that on Facebook, it's important for you to present yourself in a way that people don't think that you're living some lie or presenting yourself in some sort of fake way. That might not be true of other social media places like Instagram. I, students have been talking about sort of how you present yourself positively on Instagram, but um, I think this idea about about having a lot of different audiences looking at you at a, at a particular time and having to present yourself in an authentic way um, 
causes, uh, uh, well, it, it, it makes complexities for the representation of self. And we're going to talk about that as it relates to, um, uh, to religion um, a little bit later. Um, this context collapse, though, is, is from 2011, which is, you know, as you think about it, I was saying about Facebook from 2010, where you're still at that kind of Stephen Ives stage, you know, where, where it was a, a little bit less uh, refined. Um, this has been updated by, um, uh, by, I'm missing one slide here. Oh, I'll go back and just talk about it. About, uh, updated by uh, um, Caroline Tagg and uh, Amy Brown and Philip Sargent. We talk about context design. Um, and what they, what they say is that this is true, but you can also do things on social media to um, target particular audiences with particular messages. And that might be um, uh, how you limit audiences. You can do that now on Facebook and decide that you, you're going to make a list of a particular kind of uh, a group. Or you might do it linguistically by speaking in, if, you're, if you speak several different languages, you might speak um, in Spanish um, or post in Spanish, and that reaches a Spanish speaking audience, or post in English, that reaches is an English-speaking audience. It can also be around content as well. As, as I think about it, um, on my Facebook page, I post a lot of different things. Um, but I was doing a lot of house renovations a couple of years ago, or last year. And by posting things about house renovations, I was sort of focusing on a particular kind of audience that was interested in house renovation type stuff. And I would get likes from that group of people, but not likes from other, peop other groups of people. So although that was not a... Um, it was not something that I was doing explicitly. It was a kind of a, a kind of uh, audience uh, audience design context design that I was doing um, implicitly. It happens also on Twitter as well. We were talking about um, tweeting before and, and how you represent yourself um, on Twitter. And if I if I'm an academic and I tweet I tweet out like I did this weekend, um, my car needs a new clutch. Great. After this uh, this uh, seminar had been tweeted, and I thought to myself, "Oh, if somebody goes and like, well, Stevens is this academic. What what does he have to say about you know deep things?" And they look at, I'm complaining about my clutch or um, whatever. Uh, whether or not that uh, that puts me in a, in a negative light. I think what it does is, uh, in, t in thinking about context design and, and how we target different audiences, is that the things that we tweet are interested to interesting to different people at different times. And um, you get different audiences for different things. I've been tweeting a lot about immigration because my immigration status has just changed. And people who are interested in immigration will like those tweets about immigration. People who aren't interested in it won't do it. OK, so how does this relate then to, uh, to religion? Well, we can start off by just thinking about digital religion in general. Um, and you know, digital religion is, um, uh, help me with the name here, from Texas A&M, Heidi, Heidi Campbell. Campbell, Heidi Campbell's term. Um, uh, talking about uh, the, ex the sort of the, the expression and the use of, of uh, or the, the practice of, of, of religion in, in online spaces. Um, and I don't want to talk too much about digital religion and, and, and um, uh, sort of the different, uh, different, different ways it can be expressed. But it's, a, it's a, broad, a broad term, I think, or a broad uh, uh, area of research if you're thinking about, well, what's the difference between a prayer group potentially on, on Facebook versus um, uh, Tim Hutchings has done a lot of work on, on like online churches, full on online churches where people um, uh, uh, log in and they uh, watch sermons and they communicate with each other in, in text, box, text boxes. Um, uh, there's a lot of different things that fall underneath that, that, uh, that umbrella of, of digital religion. Um, and again, if we're talking about how, uh, uh, how digital religion changes uh, uh, or how, how technology changes the way that religion is practiced, well, in each one of these different places that you might do analysis, you'll see, um, I, I think, in, in, at least in, in, in the, the, the research that I've looked at, you'll see the ways in which people take practices from offline spaces and try to adapt them in ways in, in, in online spaces. And they're successful in different ways. So Tim Hutchings' book about, um, about uh, online churches is really interesting because it looks at sort of um, three or four different iterations of, of the way that church is done in online spaces and the ways that it was successful or, 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 or not successful. Um, the important thing is, though, that I think it, 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 it's this mixing of like taking what we understand about offline church spaces and online um, interaction, trying to mix them together in some way that, that's meaningful for people. Um, I think I I if we're thinking about the, the key difference between technological spaces and physical spaces is that um, 
the physical space that we have is um, uh, is something that can be in some way private. I was going to use this as an example, but then I noticed there's two cameras on me. I'm mic'd up. Um, I is, is going to be tweeting about it and stuff. That what's happening now in in this private space is is quite public, isn't it? Um, uh, the, there's, if I say something outrageous here, it's not just going to be you who hear it. Everyone will hear this outrageous thing I say. Um, if you think about it, though, in terms of like, let's say we had a, a small religious meeting where there wasn't um, this cameras on you and, and microphones and stuff, what's happening in that space is a very kind of private, intimate thing. Whereas online spaces, although we can have, um, uh, we can have gatekeeping places, we can have places where you have to be members to join in, it's a much more public publicly accessible kind of um, uh, a, a space. There's also a difference, I think, between being in, in a physical space together and, and sharing an, an online space um, in that uh, I think today we're all in Cardiff, we know what the weather's like, we've had an embodied experience of the day in the same way, it's five o'clock for all of us. It would be different if we were um, uh, experiencing this at, at nine o'clock, and some of us were experiencing this at the, at the end of the day, and some of us were experiencing this, this at the beginning of the day, right? Just that kind of physical experience of it would be different. Um, so online environments, what they do is they take time and space and um, complicate it in some ways. Now, what I'm interested in this in terms of belief is that you find things like um, this. This is just a screenshot of a, of a, of a website, of a Dawa website, um, with the um, with the heading World Dawa Mission, right? And um, if you look on this on this site, it's not a great uh, not a great screenshot. Um, there's nothing on this on this page here. There's nothing that you see on this page here that indicates a location of this World Dawa Mission. You've got to do some digging around to figure out where the people who are running it are from. Um, this is this isn't true just only of, of Dawa. It could, you could apply it to, to um, uh, 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 Christian missions as well and Christian churches as well. What it presents here is this idea that what is on this web page applies to you, whoever you are, wherever you are. It's a message that's for everyone, not just for people in a physical location, and that if we want to talk about global evangelism, and I'm using the term evangelism, I, it's, it's, a, it's a, a Christian, so associated with Christianity, I think, but we can apply it um, in, in, the, in the book. Um, I apply it to, to atheism, to Islam, and Christianity in the way of, of, of thinking about spreading faith or spreading belief. Um, but if we're thinking about global evangelism in online spaces, the idea here is that people view what it is that they're presenting as not being a thing for you in a particular place at a particular time. It's a thing for everybody everywhere all the time. And YouTube videos are like that. You, you click on a YouTube video, it doesn't say, here I am in this physical space and this, these physical people around me. It's, it's you and me looking at, at the viewer, whoever the viewer is. Wherever the viewer is, it applies to you. Now, I think that is, well, it's an affordance. It's not problematic, it's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing. It creates a kind of way of, of which you have to present faith in, um, in a way that uh, is different than if you're applying or you're presenting faith in a, in a physical, very limited location. It means we have to talk about things being, being bigger than just, uh, 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 just where we are, just applicable to the, the people that are around us. Um, it also, I think, one of the other interesting things I, I, I found in, in the research that I've done that I'm not going to talk too much about today is this idea about accessibility, which is that when you're presenting yourself on Twitter, you're presenting yourself on Facebook, there's this idea that anybody can contact you at any time. I can tweet anybody um, and, and get access to them. Well, that might be true of somebody who has you know, 150 followers. It would be easy to get, to get their attention. When you're talking about somebody with 3 million followers or, or, or 5 million followers or whatever, um, although it may appear that you have access to them, you don't actually have access to them because there are so many people trying to get their attention at the same time. Um, that said, the way that people present themselves in online social media spaces is quite often in this kind of intimate, accessible way. Um, this isn't only true of, of, of religious people. If you think about um, uh, people who are so-called influencers on, on Instagram or on, on, on social media sites, quite often when they're vlogging, when they're talking to themselves um, in a camera, right, they're talking to you as an individual in a private place. 
um, I've written a little bit about this as well, that the idea that when you're looking at a video like that, it's just you and that person, and it feels like they are speaking to you as an individual. Now, that's one thing in terms of, um, in terms of celebrity, to feel like you're close to a celebrity. It's another thing when you're talking to somebody who, or you're listening to somebody who's a, uh, a, a religious figure, a religious leader, who's speaking individually to you as a person. That's, a, that's, that, that's another affordance. Um, it, it allows for a feeling of, of, of being close to somebody that you wouldn't feel if you were just watching it on a television or you were just listening on the radio, you wouldn't feel in the same way that that person is speaking directly to you. So that's sort of my, my, long, my long run in to talk about some specific people um, and uh, what, I, what I write about in, in the book that Mike was talking about. Um, the way that I approach research, um, and it's, uh, if you're a student, I would suggest that you don't do this, but um, <laughs> uh, the, the way that I approach it is I look for interesting things that I want to talk about, things that I think are interesting to, to, to follow, and I try to find some systematic way of, of investigating something interesting. Um, the problem with that is that what is interesting and what is easy to systematically follow are two very different things. So once you have a sort of a systematic way of collecting tweets or collecting YouTube videos, you say, I'm going to do it from this time to this time on this person's channel, and I'm going to collect whatever, whatever happens. Um, I've been more interested in looking at, um, for lack of a better word, drama online. Mm -hmm. We all know what online drama is, right? Which is uh, sort of people arguing about, well, the idea, I think that the term drama makes it sound as though it's sort of a, a made up or a fake kind of... Uh, uh, antagonism or, or uh, negative interaction between people. Um, the, the first book that I wrote was about this um, uh, interaction between an atheist and a Christian uh, insulting each other essentially and I was looking at how these insults had developed over time. Um, this time I was a little bit more systematic. I was, I was a bit more interested in, in interaction between um, Christians, atheists, and Muslims just sort of generally in online spaces and to do that I looked at these three users um, and I always sort of say, can you figure out who is who? They all have beards, so that's sort of, I, I guess they all could have potentially, the, the beard doesn't usually, is, isn't, isn't helping. Um, uh, well, the amazing atheist is the amazing atheist, so that probably makes clear what, what his position is here. Uh, Josh Fierstein here is an, uh, an evangelical Christian. He's got a, um, a, a, a big Facebook following. When I, when I wrote the book, he had about, I think he had two million followers. I haven't checked recently how many people he has, but... Um, uh, He's, he's a, a, an American um, evangelical Christian. Um, and then John Fontaine is a, we were talking about him a little bit earlier, John Fontaine is a, um, a Dawah preacher from, I think he's originally from Manchester, but spent uh, time um, in a lot of different places around the world. If you watch his videos, um, uh, he's in uh, Sierra Leone often, um, has recently been in, uh, uh, in um, Qatar, I think. Um, uh, anyway, he's, he's, he travels around quite a bit, but is you, there's some chance that you would run into him in Cardiff or in Birmingham or in Manchester because he does do street dawah around here. I've, I've been waiting one day. I'm going to walk down the street and see him and, and sort of my jaw will drop. But um, uh, anyway, he's a, he's a dawah preacher who also makes YouTube videos. Um, and The Amazing Atheist has been around for a very long time um, and since the beginning of YouTube is, uh, uh, is well, he's the Amazing Atheist. He's, he, he's sort of a... a, a, a focused on, at least historically had been focused on, on making videos about atheism, although recently I think he's been less, less interested in it as a topic. So I was saying, looking for something interesting to write about, looking for some drama to write about. Well, an interesting thing happened right around June 2004 was Josh Feuerstein made these two videos on his Facebook page. One was called Dear Mr. Muslim um, and one was called Dear Mr. Atheist. I think the Dear Mr. Atheist one came first and the Dear Mr. Muslim one came, came after the fact. Um, in these videos, and I'm going to show you a little bit of the video in, in the analysis that I do. Um, uh, in the Dear Mr. Muslim video, if you watch it, um, uh, it doesn't seem like he's expecting to get an answer from a Muslim, I don't think. Um, he, 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 he doesn't, he, it's not a very clearly developed argument against, um, uh, against Muslims or against Islam. Um, it's really a kind of, um, at least in the analysis that I did, I think he's, he's presenting an, uh, a representation of Islam to his, his uh, evangelical Christian audience um, and um, using it as a kind of a straw man uh, argument. Um, but uh, John Fontaine responded to his video. 
Um, and uh, there was subsequent, subsequently some response back and forth. Fierstein sort of dropped out of it relatively quickly. Um, he also made this video about Dear Mr. Atheist. Again, I don't think, uh, assuming that he wasn't going to get a response or he wasn't expecting a response, and Josh, uh, the Amazing Atheist, then responded to him and continued to respond to Fierstein. Any sort of video that Fierstein made, um, the Amazing Atheist uh, made responses to it. He even came up with a... Um, uh, this is a bit tangential, but he came up with a parody character about Josh Fierstein called Josh Moronstein, and he would make parody videos as Josh Moronstein. And uh, there's a good quote from him where he says he, he's so thankful for Josh Fierstein because he's like a, he's a, he's like a money, um, a money uh, producer for him, because every time Fierstein makes a video, uh, the Amazing Atheist can do a kind of a point-by-point -point rebuttal of it, and then also make a Josh a Moronstein video parodying it. So. Um, but what I was interested in is that they had this interaction between, between the three of them. And I was, I was interested in um, how that, uh, the, first of all, the arguments developed over time, whether or not the arguments developed over time. But I was also interested in how uh, they were just using social media in general. And what I could say about how um, they were representing themselves in social media spaces. And also sort of the question that I was interested in um, and for this talk, which is about how um, language uh, or how, how interaction with other people and technology changes the way in which uh, uh, what it is you believe or what it is that you talk about. Um, I was interested um, in terms of the method of analysis that I was doing. I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm a person in doing language analysis, and so um, uh, I won't get too much into the weeds about the kind of work that I was doing, but um, I was particularly interested in how people tell, told stories and how they represented uh, uh, themselves and narratives about themselves and narratives about other people. And I was using this framework by um, uh, Michael Bamberg, who talks about uh, positioning positioning in, in narratives, and there's sort of three levels to the positioning. There's first of all, when you tell a story, the characters which interact within that story, okay? It's, it's difficult to think about this sort of in terms of, uh, of uh, abstractly, so I'll, I'll, let's think about it in terms of the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Everyone's familiar with the story of Little Red Riding Hood, right? In the story of Little Red Riding Hood, you have the characters interacting within the story of Little Red Riding Hood. You've got Little Red Riding Hood, you've got Grandma, you've got the wolf, you've got the Axe? I've said Axe Man. The, hunts <laughs> <laughs> the Huntsman. The Huntsman. That is it. Um, and those inter characters interact, and there's a story around them, okay? That's the first level of a story, right? The second level of a story is me telling the story to someone. Now, I probably wouldn't be telling the story of Little Red Riding Hood to you for any reason, um, but you could imagine me telling it to the story of, or telling that story to my kids, right? I've got three daughters. I tell them the story of Little Red Riding Hood. I'm doing something in the telling of that story to them, aren't I? It's a kind of instruction, it's a kind of warning about following your parents, um, I don't know, orders. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's about this, not only the story that I'm telling, but why I'm telling the story in a particular context to a particular audience. There are things I can learn about the story and about my relationship with my daughters by the telling of that story. That's level two. Level three is a kind of an ideological, um, cultural level where it tells you something about how I see myself in the world more generally. I see myself as a father being in some way responsible for the, the um, uh, uh, instruction of, of uh, I don't know, good, uh, good uh, behavior for my kids. Um, uh, it also probably tells me something about how I see the world being dangerous in, in, in a particular way. Um, when you look at the ways in which people talk about the, worlds that the, the world that they're in and the, the stories that they tell, you can learn things about them and learn things about how they see their audience and also things about the culture in which they exist. So let's talk about um, let's talk about these these two videos. I want to show you a little bit of this video from uh, Josh Fierstein first. Here, um, I have about um, ten minutes left, so I'm gonna gonna move quickly through this. I won't show you the whole whole video. Fierstein puts his videos on you on on Facebook. This is an upload of somebody else has re-uploaded his video on onto YouTube. So it's not the original one, but you can see it's in um, it's in uh, portrait mode as opposed to landscape. So you're meant to see it on your phone, right? And if you think about looking at it on your phone, it's a very, I was talking about that point about being spoken to directly, right? So um, you can see, um, if you're thinking about watching this video, think about it that way, where you would come up and it would be Fierstein speaking to you face to face, essentially. And this is what he says. Um, I'll show just about the first 30 seconds of this. 
Muslim. Now, I must preface what I'm going to say by simply saying that, that my Muslim friends are some of the most kind, caring, compassionate, incredible individuals I have ever met. And to be quite honest with you, and sadly so, well, your propensity towards prayer and dedication to your religion puts most Christians to shame. However, I have just a couple of questions. You see, it is that over the last week I've gotten a couple hundred emails at least from Muslims around the world that have congratulated me on the video that I recently made. And yet at the same time they have questioned, well, they have questioned my claim that Jesus Christ is in fact the Messiah. Whoa, okay, well, we'll end it there. Um, you, can, you can go back. I'm going to uh, I have the, the, the bit.ly, the, the URL for this if you want to go back and watch the video. Although I probably don't, you can probably figure out what he's going to say um, after this. Um, I was interested in this in, in terms of positioning and how he's talking about himself and how he's talking about himself into, in relationship to this, this Muslim audience. Um, this idea where he's, uh, he's positioning himself and positioning the Muslims in, in some way as being, well, associated with each other, right? He's, he's talking about propensity to religion and, and prayer. There's a kind of positive, um, uh, 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 positive positioning that's, that's happening here between, between him and, and, and the audience. Now he goes on to talk about, of course, about talking about um, Jesus as the Messiah as, as is sort of his topic. Um, and if, if we're sort of used to listening to sort of discourse between Christians and Muslims, this is to be expected, isn't it? The kind of thing that you would expect that, that, that he, would, he would bring up. Um, I'm, I was interested in talking about how, um, how technology changes, what, what it is to believe and what it is that we have to talk about. The fact that, that Feirstein brings this up presents Islam in this way, in a positive light first, and then goes on to talk about Jesus as the Messiah. Um, makes the conversation that will follow about Jesus as the Messiah, right? If you're going to respond to Feirstein, you have to respond to that point. Now, the, the, the thing about this is that if Feirstein is talking about something else, you would focus on that other thing. So it's sort of a, a talk about a sort of a, a reality that doesn't exist. But the fact that he's talking about Jesus as the Messiah, it puts the conversation about religion in terms of talking about Jesus being God or, or not being God, which is, as you, th as you look at the responses to it, become the topic of the conversation. So the video that, uh, that Feirstein or that, that John Fontaine makes as a response has to pick up on that topic of Jesus as the Messiah. It changes the orientation of the argument towards a particular topic. Now, the same sort of thing happens within that, that positioning about, about the audience and, and the person who's speaking in a, in, in a positive way. Um, Fontaine is positive towards Feirstein as well. Um, I'm going to play from about three minutes in where he's talking about, um, where he's talking about uh, uh, Feirstein's argument. But um, again, it's this positive kind of interaction between the two of them. He's not necessarily being, uh, being negative or attacking him. Um, Mr. Muslim. You can see that he's taken some of the video and he's replaying it and responding to it as he's going forward, just to get a sense of it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in about uh, three minutes into it where he picks up on this point about Jesus being, uh, being God or being the Messiah. For he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. As a Muslim, we have no problem. It doesn't contradict Islam. Jesus is the way, it's the way we follow. Jesus is the truth. He will believe he was truthful. He is alive. We have to follow him in his life. No one can get to him. No one can get to God except we believe in him. No problem. It's your interpretation that now. And somehow through this verse, you're, you're interpreting that Jesus is claiming divinity. When he looks at his disciples... Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Um, so again, in you're thinking about how this conversation is developing and what topics it is that they're focusing on, they're focusing on that thing that, uh, that Feirstein has introduced into the conversation, the, the initial move within, this, uh, within this, this sort of drama interaction. And it forces Fontaine into a place. I say force is probably too strong of a word. It means that Fontaine, if he's going to talk about religion, he's going to talk about faith, he has to do it in, uh, in relationship to this argument about the, de the deity of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Now, that's not necessarily 
There's, no, there's no, not anything wrong about that one way or the other. But if you think about all the different things that you could talk about in relationship to Islam, the deity of Christ is, well, it's only important if you're a Christian, right? I mean, or you're in a Christian culture, you're talking about um, uh, whether or not Jesus is, is, is God or not. That's a topic that is oriented towards a Christian audience. And the fact that, that Fontaine is talking about it in this, in this, in, in this way, in this orientation towards, um, towards Fierstein, it's also a discussion, um, we, can, we can think about that, that, again, that level two of, of the positioning. The audience that he's talking to is, an, is, is, a, is a Christian audience. It's an audience that is, um, um, uh, is well, I shouldn't say it's, it's only a Christian audience. It's, it's, a, it's an audience that's oriented towards the beliefs of Christianity as opposed to an audience that's oriented towards the beliefs of Islam. You could watch videos that Fontaine makes that aren't responses to Christians that are about um, other, other topics. He's not he's talking about things related specifically to is, Islam. Now, I think the point about all this is that if... If Fontaine wants to enter into this conversation, and Fierstein's got all these followers, and he wants to be in, in, in conversation with him, his discussion and the things that he talks about has to be oriented towards the things that Fierstein is interested in. And I think that has consequences for the, the sort of conversations that develop about Islam where suddenly Jesus has to be, in, in, in Fontaine's talk, and you look at him doing a dawah, particularly in Western countries, Christian countries, he spends a lot of time talking about Jesus and the role of Jesus within his, Islam. That is uh, as a result of having to speak to a particular context, to a particular group of people. Is this going to work now? You have to click just just one more time, yeah. So just a couple of key points about this. I thought one of the interesting things about this is that the conflict itself creates the conversation between people. And it orients the topic of conversation. So if there's conflict around the deity of Christ, the deity of Christ, that's the thing that people are going to, um, to, to engage about. Now, is that the most important thing to talk about? Well, it is for Fierstein, potentially. But is it for Fontaine? I, don't, I, don't, I, I think that's, a, that's an open question to say that is, is, that a, um, uh, is that the main thing that he wants to be talking about in, in relationship to, to Islam? Well, he has to do that because of the, the, the drama, the debate is oriented in that way. It, it makes the conversation go in a particular way. The other thing that I think is really interesting about this is that the debate doesn't actually bring any clarity to the conversation. I mean, they go back and forth, they go back and forth, they go back and forth. It's clear that there's no movement on either side. Um, towards um, a, 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 a recognition of the problems that one argument has and um, sort of saying, well, I'm going to move this or I'm going to change my belief about that. It's the, 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 the presentation of the argument is really oriented towards um, representing your own belief and talking about your own belief in relationship to what other people say. So the, the focus is on the, the, whatever the topic that, that's come up, but that's, it's about talking about what you believe and uh, how you're, you're positioning yourself in, in the social world. Um, and that point that I've been trying to make here, that because it's about one thing, it's not about another thing. And that has consequences for how the conversation goes forward and um, uh, how people talk about what they believe. Just, uh, one point then about that, that context collapse. And I think the thing that I've seen in my research is that what this interaction online tends to do is put people in a place where they have to not only talk to people who are opposed to them, but talk in a way that is also acceptable to people that are on their side, and then also then in a way that's acceptable to the people who are potentially interested, the people that they're trying to, to bring into their, um, uh, their belief as well. And this creates a really complicated context wherein um, if, you, if you watch someone like Fierstein or someone like uh, um, uh, uh, Fontaine talk, that, that first point about what Fierstein says, where he's talking about Muslims being you know, the most compassionate, the, the most pious people that he knows, that is in some way trying to, uh, trying to pay attention to this group of people in a positive way. Whereas if he was just talking to people who were agreeing with him, whether or not he would say that or not, um, I think is, 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 is questionable. I think he would be less likely to say it if he wasn't trying to appeal to this group of people as well. 
And if he was just attacking Muslims, and he wasn't thinking at all about people who he might be trying to get on, on board with him, who are interested but uncommitted, he might be more aggressive, right? So the point about uh, the, 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 this, this relationship to, uh, to context and being in public places is actually I think that it, it, it has a positive effect on, on religious discourse because it forces people to think about things from other different perspectives. Because if Fontaine just makes an attack or Feuerstein just makes an attack video and doesn't think about these other, these other parts of the, the context, it puts him in a place where um, uh, uh, people will, be, will, will point that out to him to say, well, you, you, you haven't taken this into account. You have to be aware in some way in presenting faith in online spaces uh, in a way that is amenable to these different groups of people at the same time. And I think actually that this has a moderating effect on, on, on how people talk publicly about faith. Now, this is the, I started off with that, my, my, my point about the thing in New Zealand, and I'm ending on this point that's essentially a positive one about the moderating effect of online discourse. Well, clearly that's not always the case, right? And there are still locations where people are talking in ways where they aren't paying any attention to this kind of thing, and it's a focus on us versus them. And as I think about this now, and I think about that in relationship to Achan or, or the, um, the online spaces where the alt-right is, is planning attacks or, or thinking about racism and that kind of stuff, I don't know if this continues to apply in those spaces as well. I do think in social media and public spaces where people are trying to gain more followers that, th that this is the case, but I don't think that it applies across the board. It clearly doesn't which is a negative space to, place to end. I'm sorry, but that's, that's, that's how I'm feeling on, on today, the 20th of March, 2019. I hope, I hope, I hope that this, this is the one that wins out, that this, that this tends to be, that, that the, this, what we saw last week is the exception, and, and this is the rule, but it, it will, it will, we'll have to see. We'll have to see going forward. Um, I have some references here, but I, I'll put this, um, uh, this, the bit.ly here, so you can, you can look at them if you want to, and um, my email address, and, and I'll sell the book to you as well. Um, uh, so thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs>